It was a drawing of Mommy and the family friend, with his PP next to Mommy's wee wee. If you like this type of content about true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs. In this episode, we start off with a story about a best friend and disloyal girlfriend's affair, resulting in betrayal, nuclear revenge and a happy ending that's fairy tale worthy. Followed by a cheating wife living like a queen, but gets kicked off her throne by a kid's drawing that reveals her dirty secrets. Lastly, a high school love story, in which the cheating girlfriend gets disarmed by a bad Samaritan. Before we start, firmly put the like button in a chokehold, but don't let go until it feels remorse for its actions. Let's dive in. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. Full disclosure, this isn't my story. It happened to a friend of mine who lives in USA a long time ago, so dialogue isn't exact. He gave me permission to post his story online. For ease of writing, I'll write it as if it happened to me. Due to the nature of the story, some details have been changed. I live with my girlfriend Karen and my old grade school friend Jake, who was working as a sales rep. We live on the outskirts of a well-known city in the States. I was in my late 20s, I found myself looking for work as a bar I was working at closed down. Knowing I was desperate for work, Jake calls me and tells me his new girlfriend, named Jill, just purchased a motel bar with a small kitchen and she is after hired help. Needless to say, I jump at the opportunity as Karen wasn't working, the bills were piling up and our health insurance was due. I called Jill, arranged to meet her at her new property to introduce myself. Jake made the introductions in person and had already told Jill I was a hands-on person with hospitality experience. Now to explain, my dad is a sparky and believes if you can pay someone to fix something, you could probably do it cheaper yourself. He taught me lots and still does to this day. After a 30 minute chat, Jill tested me with a few odd jobs like rewiring an outlet, fixing a clogged sink and quizzed me on liquor laws. Needless to say, I was hired that day. The work was all about getting the property ready for business at the start. Jill thought it would have been minor works, paint, replacement of fixings and furniture, but we soon found out the electrical wires were shot, the whole place needed rewiring which was a cause of stress for Jill, as it would have blown her budget. Lucky for Jill, my dad was between contracts and offered his services using leftover stock, already paid for from other jobs. Jill would need to cover the cost of any new product required. As for payment for his labor, he said he enjoys a steak and beer on Friday nights. After a three weeks of helping dad, the wiring was done, was up to code and at a fraction of the cost. Jill and I spent one to two months painting all 15 motel rooms, bistro and the bar. Cleaning the kitchen, cool rooms etc. Jake would offer to help but always left after 20 minutes saying he has to make a sale. Jill often worked well into the night. After all, this was her dream. I'd take some furniture home to restore after hours and return it once restored. Business opened up after six months, and thanks to dad, opened under budget. Jill managed the business and ran the kitchen, I worked where I was needed. In the kitchen, on the bar, tending to maintenance. I was on salary, second in charge and could work in any position. Things went smoothly for a year. Business was turning a profit. Dad was getting his weekly beer and steak. Karen seemed happy. Jake was still working as a sales rep for a pharmaceutical company. One day I felt sick at work, so I clocked off and went home early. Pulling into my driveway, with the exception of a turning gut, things felt normal. Jake's car was there but he lived there, so I didn't think anything was wrong. As usual, I parked behind Jake, important for later. When I opened the door, I was confronted with the scene of Karen doing the reverse cowgirl with Jake on the couch. After seeing me, Jake grabbed his pants and ran out through the back door. Karen and I argued into the night, she tried blaming me. Saying I'm never home, I'm spending too much time with Jill, in reality, our relationship was strictly professional. I went to bed and told her she can sleep in Jake's bed, as she clearly finds it more comfortable. I called Jill and informed her of this as Jake was her boyfriend. She was upset as he cheated on her 
but admitted she suspected he was seeing someone else. Jill offered me a room at the motel until I figure out my next move. The next day I loaded my personal effects in the truck. Jake's car was still there as I had blocked it in. I told Karen she can keep the rental and the furniture. I said I'd be back for my tools in a few hours and I would appreciate if she wasn't there. I went home that afternoon to load my tools into my truck, while I was grabbing something from under my workbench, I found a bag I wasn't familiar with. Upon closer inspection, I found in a large quantity little tablets. The way they were packed and hidden made me realize they were probably party pills. A thorough search of the house led to me finding two more bags and about 12k in cash. I put two and two together and realized that Jake's pharmaceutical sales job was code for dealer. It made me realize Jake probably gave these to Karen for sexy time. I was beyond angry, until I realized that I have all I need to get revenge. Jake's car still hadn't moved, I went inside and grabbed his spare keys, chucked on a pair of gloves that were in the garage. I put half the money and one bag of the pills in his boot. I removed his spare tire from the wheel well and put the bag in there. The two other bags, I threw them down the storm drain in the laneway behind my house. As for the 6k cash, Jake did cost me a house full of furniture. Just saying. I sent a message to both Jake and Karen with the typical hurt script, I can't believe you did this, we were friends blah blah blah. I've left, I hope you two are happy together. I then made an anonymous tip to the local police and ATF, about a man fitting Jake's description, loading what looks like narcotics into a car that described Jake's car. I also provided a partial plate number that matched his car. It didn't take long for law enforcement to find the car and locate the pills. What I wasn't counting on, is that Karen was driving the car at the time. She was later released when they found out she was driving the wrong car at the wrong time. A warrant went out for Jake's arrest. As icing on the cake, I found out later that not only the police was after Jake, his supplier was as well, as he lost a lot of product. Fast forward three months, I purchased a house, I was still working with Jill. Karen was pregnant with Jake's baby and he was on the run. I suspected she was keeping contact with Jake, because she suddenly left the district when she was eight months pregnant. Twelve months after the incident, during a drunken night, Jill and I mixed business with pleasure and started dating. That was ten years ago. We are married now, have two children and just opened our third business. Dad still gets his weekly steak and beer. I did hear a rumor that Jake and Karen wound up in Alaska but can't confirm this. I do feel a little bad about it now, because Jake made it possible for me to date Jill and live a wonderful life. I do hope all is well with them. The audacity of the woman and her loudmouth new husband makes for a good experience I had to share. This story is about my uncle's revenge and how he stripped his wife of everything. From status, children, the family dog and money. Here it goes. So my uncle and his wife had a very good relationship. They did everything together. She was a good mother, but was dependent on my uncle for money. He earned while she stayed at home sexy timing another man and looking after the kids, 6 and 12. How nice right, a really lovely and caring wife. For more context, my other uncle had died, so of course my uncle was mourning for a few months, he wanted love and to be cuddled, so he declined sexy time for some time to mourn. Well, his wife surely didn't care, she would give him a kiss and a quick hug, then carry on doing whatever she was doing, such as cooking and cleaning. We noticed the situation was a bit of, so we would ask him how is it that she seemed so distant and his reply was that, everyone deals with grief a certain way. Turns out her grieving process included sexy timing with another man, a family friend of all things. My uncle's brother had died and during this time, they had many friends visit them at their house, especially from a family friend they had known forever, who would visit with his child, so that the children could play while the grown-ups talked to each other. My uncle didn't think anything of it or the frequency of which this man would visit, especially when it was during the day. He thought it was a drop-off-his-son kind of thing, so the children could play. That was until his little boy, my uncle's kid, drew a picture he wanted to show to his daddy. My little cousin said it was a secret and mommy said, family friend, and her were playing a new game that only they could play. 
that already made my uncle suspicious. But never did he think his wife would ever cheat on him, especially since he was still in mourning. In fact we were all shocked, this woman is so prim and proper to a T, with a clean house, good mannerisms, fine clothes and upturned nose. His son proceeds to take out a crumpled piece of paper which he had hidden from under his bed and shows it to my uncle saying he went to fetch it from the bin after his mommy threw it away. It was a drawing. He has explained that mommy had told him not to draw her and the family friend again. Because it's a private game that nobody can know about. However, my uncle's son was feeling hurt by this and went to retrieve his drawing. He knows his dad would surely like his drawing and would praise him for it. It turns out, after some explanation, that it was a drawing of the family friend sticking his pee pee next to mommy's wee wee. My uncle took pictures of the drawing, while shaking and realizing what was happening. He recorded everything his son said about what he drew. He asked things like when and where mommy was playing these games. Turns out, she did it when she thought the kids were busy during the day. While they were playing outside and that she basically had sexy time around the whole house while locking the doors and leaving the kids without supervision for a few minutes. He also found out that that the older kids made their own game of observing the adults having sexy time. They would make the young kids play, to pretend everybody was still playing outside. The children would essentially take turns to see what family friend, my uncle's wife were doing out of curiosity. This coming from the most self-important, prim and proper woman you'd ever meet. When confronted by my uncle, her response to my uncle when he asked her, why? She said and I kid you not, you wouldn't give me what I needed and kept denying me, so I went to look for it somewhere else. She also said something along the lines of, I had a right to do it, since you weren't giving me what I needed or caring about me. Not only did the kids see that nonsense. Not only did she neglect them for selfish reasons and lock them outside for a few minutes. Not only was she unfaithful as he was mourning for his brother. She had the sheer audacity to claim it was because of him and she as a wife has sexy time and fulfillment needs, that needing to feel wanted and loved was important for a woman of her stature. On top of that, the guy who was a family friend, also had the audacity to speak up and say that what she did was right and that my uncle should have taken care of her. Imagine thinking you're justified in having an affair with someone, destroying their marriage with children involved, and still believe you're righteous in your actions. Move on a few months. They got divorced, they share custody of the dog and children while she gets married to the guy she cheated on him with. She left my uncle for someone else. He being who he was tried letting it go, he tried to forgive her, went to church, prayed for her to have a good life, never spoke bad about her and so on. My uncle took care of her, worked hard to give her everything she wanted. Even after her disloyal activities and blame, he tried to let it rest and forgive. But that's not the ending, in the end, he took it all back. He ruined her for her infidelity and leaving him to marry someone else, he also made sure the family friend would get his fair share. He actually messed up both their lives. And yes, it was amazingly rewarding, even for us. So one day, she started talking to him about having the kids stay over at her house. This continued to her texting messages about how she missed him. He finally woke up and caught on to what she was doing and what she wanted. She wanted to be with him, ultimately have sexy time with him and cheat on her new husband. So she kept sending him these questionable messages, about how she missed sexy time with him. Thus he used her feelings and urges, to manipulate her into sending tons of texts and videos to him by leading her on, which he finally sent to her new husband. This was while they were trying for a baby with each other. But this stay-at-home wife would now learn her lesson. In fact, they both would. It taught them both a valuable and ironic lesson. In the end, she will always cheat. The family friend, who defended her cheating and married her, would learn what it's like to be in my uncle's position. Serves him right for helping her cheat and defending her actions. Let's see what you say now you're on the other side of the story. Then when the new husband left my aunt, she couldn't take care of the children and the laws in my country are funny, she also carelessly signed a prenup. She was left out on the street, not being able to care for her children, she had no experience in any field and no fine clothing or jewelry left to act like a proper queen living of someone else's labor and money. She begged and pleaded for shelter, 
as well as to see her children, but eventually that stopped when she disappeared to God knows where. So he ended up with full custody of the dog and his children. Win-win for everyone. Except for the cheaters. This story happened back when I was in high school, about five years ago, so it's safe to talk about it now. Stan, one of my good friends and teammate, had a girlfriend called Liz during our junior year of high school. No one on our team really liked Liz. She was pretty self-centered and was always that obnoxious girl in class who always wanted to be the center of attention. She also was one of the more attractive girls in our class, and she knew it. Liz was the kind of girl who would do anything to be popular, and in this case, that meant getting in a relationship with our top wrestler slash football player. Stan, however, is a great guy. He was team captain, scholar athlete, took advanced courses in school, and I'm not even kidding when I say he was friends with everyone in that school. So coming into junior year, when most athletes go from the JV squad to varsity, it was no surprise that Liz started flirting with Stan Moore and hanging out around him in the halls during lunch and before school. Soon Stan and Liz got together and made it Facebook official. Of course, people were happy for them, but my teammates and I could tell, soon after they got together, that she was not a good match for Stan. She was very manipulative, she always invited herself to our team get-togethers, which mostly was 10 to 15 guys in a house watching Monday night football or playing videos games and going over our playbook. Anytime Stan would go out anywhere, Liz would try and force her way in somehow. If Stan went out without her, she would constantly text him and make him feel bad for not inviting her, thus ruining his time, since he would spend most of his time on the phone with her calming her down from her tantrums. However, after about three months of being together, one of our teammates found she made a profile on a dating app. We told Stan about it and he confronted Liz. Somehow, she made a good enough excuse that Stan bought and they stayed together, but don't worry, not for long. About three weeks after the incident, Stan was picking up dinner for his family. When he entered the restaurant, he saw Liz holding hands over the table with another guy from a different school. After he dropped the food off at home, he went to Liz's place. Her house had one of those small angled windows next to the front door where when the blinds are up, you can see into the living room from behind the couch. He looked inside and saw her sitting on top of this guy, making out, with the guy's hands on her chest. He took a photo and left, holding back tears and feeling broken. They broke up that night and since that was Stan's first real girlfriend, it really took a toll on him. His grades started slipping. At this point, he was in wrestling season, and he lost a lot of weight from stress and not eating. All his friends tried to cheer him up, but what made it worse, was the fact that not even a week later, Liz was with some new guy, not even the same guy from the photo. She also rubbed salt on his wounds by openly talking to our classmates, saying how great the new guy was in bed, Liz was also Stan's first. My teammates and I were pissed, we were watching as our friend was getting more and more depressed each day, and how Liz kept screwing with Stan emotionally. This continued for about five to six weeks. That's when we had enough. It was time to kick her out of our school. Now the state we lived in had just passed a law allowing the use of recreational marijuana for people over the age of 21, but shops weren't open yet. So I contacted my older brother, who had just graduated from college from a town notorious in the state for its pot culture. I told him the story and gave him some money to get some weed. Our plan was to stash the weed in her locker, then have one of our female friends anonymously leave a tip to the office, saying Liz was smoking in the bathroom stalls. What I didn't expect, was my friend wanting to pitch in, and also leave in her locker a couple of his doctor prescribed Adderall pills. We were young and didn't know the serious charges that could come from that, we just knew it wasn't legal for her to have those if she wasn't prescribed them. So, we took the weed and pills, and one day after the last class let out, when she was by her locker putting her textbooks away, we distracted her and I tucked the goodie bag behind one of her bottom textbooks. I shifted the top book against the back of the locker, so you couldn't see it, unless you pulled out the top textbook and looked in the bottom back corner of the locker. We did this during the day, because our school had cameras in the hallways, and we thought it would look suspicious if someone who wasn't Liz opened up the locker. After school, 
our friend called the school office to tip them off about a locker with a narcotic stashed inside. Now since the school knew that pot had just become legal, they had a zero-tolerance policy with drugs and alcohol. The following Monday before school started, we watched as the student resource officer came in with a canine and proceeded to sniff out all the lockers in the school. They marked each locker that the canine sat in front of, and locked them so you couldn't open them, even if you took the padlock off. I think there was a total of six or seven lockers marked, but it didn't matter to us. The weed that was in Liz's locker was so strong that you could smell it just by walking past it down the hall. Later we heard that during first period, the officer came into Liz's class and pulled her out. We're guessing she had to open the locker in front of him and let him search. Of course, he found the baggie, but what we later heard was that she even failed a drug test, she must have smoked prior to the incident. She was charged with a juvenile felony, because of the pills and weed and was expelled. She tried to blame Stan saying that they shared a locker earlier in the year, but with his great track record in school, and the fact that he offered to take a drug test, which he of course passed, they didn't believe her for a second. Liz went on to rant about the situation on Facebook, blaming the school for an invasion of privacy. Liz had to spend the rest of her high school classes at one of the district's remedial high schools, the type with stricter teachers and metal detectors and pat-downs as you enter. The following senior year Stan went on to have one of his best years. He graduated with honors, got accepted into his dream college, and won male athlete of the year. Meanwhile, Liz still showed up to our high school's away football and basketball games, so she could hang out with her friends, but during the summer, right after graduation, Liz came out on social media saying she was five months pregnant. She must have gotten knocked up right before graduation. Stan has now graduated with his degree and was able to travel this last summer with his girlfriend around parts of Asia. In the end, all I'm at fault for is making her switch schools, and putting a juvenile record on her for maybe about seven months, which was lifted when she turned 18. Meanwhile, Liz is dealing with the struggle of being a single parent, working full-time as a receptionist for a clinic, and still living at home with her parents. Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe or give Royal AI some sugar by avenging the like button. Could you imagine doing one of these acts yourself? Share your experience below. I'll join the conversation.